This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute, and available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Damien Filatro about choosing a distributed model and hiring remote and freelance workers within the modern world of work. Damien Filiatra, welcome to the conversation today. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from California. I'm south of Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the recruitment space, uh, specifically really distributed models and hiring remote and freelance workers in the modern world of work and how things are shifting in the age of AI and all of the, the connected confounding factors, really, and the the transformations that we see occurring because of these disruptive technologies. As we get started, I wanted to share Damien's bio with everybody. Damien Filatro is the founder and CEO of Scalable Path, a software staffing agency that matches leading companies and startups with vetted remote software developers. Scalable Path has helped 23.5K freelancers in 177 countries complete 780,000 hours of programming on client projects. Damien is passionate about employment equity and helping companies meet their hiring needs. And I'm sure there's a whole lot more to say there. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background, personal context, or your company before we dive on in? Just to say that I started the company back in in 2010 after um, spending a stint in India, managing a team over there and, and saw the challenges of uh, the time zone and the culture working with the U.S. and since then started working a lot with 
um, developers in Latin America for our U.S. clients and found that with the time zone and the, the cultural affinity, that worked mm. pretty darn well. Um, mm -hmm. Just a little more. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at Clavio.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like max cushion, max soft landings with DNA Loft V2 foam, and max smooth rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away, all while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at salesforce.com slash products slash service. You know, insight on some of our focus. So many challenges when you're trying to uh, offshore operations and work with uh, distributed remote teams. And you, you just briefly highlighted, you know, one of those things that can be challenging, and that is just simply the geographic difference and the time difference uh, and how the collaborations and communication happens when you're in that kind of a setting. It, it's not like we can't overcome it, but it is an added layer of challenge. And so it's definitely something we need to think about. Um, all right. So as we set the stage for the conversation today, uh, maybe we can start with your kind of general assessment of where we're at in the modern world of work in relation to tech, because a lot has happened in the last year, particularly the last eight to 10 months, especially around AI. I mean, just within the last couple of days, there's been some pretty major tech announcements um, and, and new AI offerings uh, that have come out. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of all the big announcements from face from Meta, Facebook yesterday, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, lots of uh, announcements around ChatGPT and BARD and some of the others just in the last week. Um, these have lots of applications across a wide range of, of different disciplines and fields and uh, different functions within a business. Within the recruiting world, though, I think it in particular has some really important value and some serious considerations that we have to keep in mind. So let's start there. If you can tell us a little bit about your current feelings around the current landscape. I'll keep it high level at first and say that, uh, you know, you say in the world of tech and recruiting, um, you could take that two ways. You could talk about um, technology that recruiters use. Yeah. And you could also talk about, um, you know, technical recruiting, like recruiting technical talent. And, and mm -hmm. we're doing both of those things. Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying that in the world of software developers, I think we were potentially one of the first industries um, to embrace remote work yeah. because it, it, works really well and maybe we're a bunch of introverts at heart and you know co programmers but just coding on your computer and and pushing your code to a repository and it, it just sort of works so I think even before COVID we were all doing that and so that's just one observation you've seen it spread into other industries through COVID and then other industries have started to pull back, you know, where it will stick is, uh, is interesting, but one topic that we could go into, but I'll just put a, make a comment on is that there's always a balance as a company, um, when you're hiring, uh, and you're considering working with a remote team is 
what's going to make your workers happy, right? And there's yeah. a balance of power shifting there where it's like some of the best workers out there really want to be remote. And mm-hmm. if you're not going to offer that as a company, you know, you may be missing out on that, not to mention the, the benefits to the planet and, and to people's lives. But so the remote, in my opinion, uh, is here to stay for a lot of industries. And you, it's something that we're going to have to embrace. Now, now, going back to your other, um, other way you can interpret your question of like tech in recruiting Um, there are a lot of people out there who have been using automation in QA. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been doing that for a while. And then more recently, AI, um, AI, I would see as a subset of automation. It's just a more advanced form of automation in hiring. And I think that my personal opinion is there's a lot of good tools out there. You have to be really careful about where where you implement it in your process to make sure that you don't degrade the process for either the the applicants or or your clients, the end the the hiring the person doing the hiring, whether that's yourself or or a client of yours. Um, and I think, in my opinion. A lot of the companies out there are are taking it a bit too far on the um, AI and automation. Um, There's a little bit of like a hype going around where everything's got to be AI or that the thing you've got to prioritize is saving cost at all costs, right? Or, you know, and I think if you try to offload some crucial steps like interviewing people (laughs) by, by AI, I think AI can do it. Right. But are the results really good or reliable? I I don't think we're there yet. And I think a lot of people are kind of pretending that we are there. And um, just because it can save them a lot of money or time or even, Potentially, they can tell a story to VC companies to get funding for their product, and VCs are eating mm-hmm. up the AI story. So, just to how that reflects back to our business, like we'll use automation in parts of our flow, but when it comes down to performing interviews with candidates, we have real humans doing it live on Zoom, just like we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know who you're talking to, you can tell whether they're telling you can't always tell whether someone's telling the truth but i think it's easier for a human than uh you know a piece of software to tell if someone's uh being uh real with you so um yeah well can can i zoom in a little bit on a couple of those points uh because i think you made some really good uh points and and highlighted some really significant issues uh so one Simply, the, you know, the, the AI bandwagon effect. Um, <laughs> things have have evolved, developed so so rapidly over the past eight to ten months. I mean, AI is not new. It's it, AI, deep machine learning, and other forms of automation have been around for a really long time. As you know, we've always been trying to figure out how to do things more effectively, and more efficiently. What's happened in the last eight to ten months is just the rapid uh, usage of AI by the the random company right and the the random user and the 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 number of tools that are being released on a regular basis so so the 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 primary platforms themselves you have open ai and chat gpt for example or you have llama and meta and you have bard and google and so on and so on and so on all of these companies keep on rolling out new features on a very at a very rapid pace uh and then users uh, or, or or various companies are then spinning out new tools utilizing and based on these AI um, frameworks. Uh, and, and those tools are coming out constantly. So it almost a week doesn't go by that we don't have at least a couple dozen new business application tools that utilize AI in some way, these, these large language models, um, which in a, 
on, on one hand is really cool and it's it's a fun kind of wild wild west world of like all these potential opportunities on the other hand what i see as a very dangerous thing is just not not even the ethical concerns of ai and all that that's a whole other conversation but just like the practicality of being able to use all of these tools so i see so many companies because the the siren song of efficiency and productivity and everything they just keep adopting tool after tool after tool and there's no possible way you can use all those tools effectively so you start to get buried by tools none of which you're fully utilizing uh, all of which are still kind of building the plane while they're flying it none of them really quite know what they're doing and and they haven't really proven their use cases yet and so i'm all for experimentation but you have to be very careful that you don't you know, start drowning by just the mass amounts of these, of these tools that are out there. And you're constantly, you know, you could very easily burn out your team with rolling out new things constantly, literally almost every week, if you were on top of all the new releases of, of AI tools. Another thing that you mentioned, uh, you know, specifically in the recruitment space is there are very important human touch points in the, the applicant experience process, right? And so you have to think about the applicant experience and how that feeds into the employee experience. And you want people to have a really great experience. And while there are efficiencies that can come from the usage of any automation, and in this case, we're talking about AI, uh, you need to make sure that you're having those touch points and that you're a real life person um, who has the intuition and has the various capacities that go beyond an algorithm that you you have a chance to have those interactions with other humans on the other side uh, for for good outcomes for the business, but also for them. Uh, remember, we're in a tight labor market. It's hard to find good people. There's a skills gap in a lot of industries. And when we're talking about any STEM field, including tech and coding and those sorts of things, it's not like we have tons of extra people going around. We We have to make sure that we create an inviting environment for people to want to come and work for us. And if we don't have a good user experience, uh, then then that the likelihood of that goes down dramatically. Um, and, and I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've heard lots of people talk about features, for example, like um, LinkedIn, and you can apply to jobs on LinkedIn, super easy, right? You can have people identify you and reach out to you. I get like bombarded constantly daily with like recruitment email spam and stuff like that. But also if you ever go into like the, the jobs area of LinkedIn, I mean, they have like quick apply kind of features and you can go in and if I wanted to, I could probably spend an hour and apply for like 50 jobs, um, super fast and easy. The question is, does it do any good? Does anyone actually look at it? Because all of that is just AI algorithm behind the scenes I, no, I, trying to figure I stuff out. I 100% agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, y you bring up a good point there. Like all this automation is just automation is a big bucket right yeah and so but i want to come back to two things you said but yes this thing where oh yeah our lives will just get easier because we can automate um the application to a position or automate the parsing of a resume or the review or, or we can send a uh candidate a link and say record your own interview with this ai and then we're going to analyze mm -hmm. your answers and then no humans aren't doing anything anymore so then you just instead of getting one or two hundred applicants for a job that a human could actually parse now you've got a thousand and you actually can't do anything without ai because you're never going to have time to do it anyway and all you needed to hire was one person anyway I mean, do you really need thousands of applicants necessarily? Like, so there, there are so many things to unpack in, in there too. I mean, like there, I can share a link with you, but um, d digging into the, the, the area that I'm most kind of paying attention to is like, can AI actually like review someone's resume and like interview them and actually replace the human recruiter and like so far the tools are, they're just not showing it and, and there's an example from an M mit uh, podcast that i can share with you ab about this company that claimed that they could do it and you know the the applicant um 
was te- the MIT podcaster was testing it and they answered all the questions in German. And then they get, they like passed the interview that was supposed to be in English. It's, mm-hmm. it's just um, so silly. And, and a lot of mm-hmm. these tools are also, you have to be so careful too, because as we know, like, you know, there's a big issue with, uh, you know, trying to not be uh, biased or discriminate right. against different people. And a lot of these AI tools end up being worse than humans at, at stuff like that. And so when you leave things in the hands of these of these tools at this point in time, like I'm not saying it could never happen, maybe if we, we get to some future level, but right now we are just not there and you need to have humans to have good results but also like you like you mentioned like there's there's an experience that that a client has or a or a a candidate has when they talk to a human and they feel valued you know like if i'm if i'm a software developer and i've got a job and i'm trying to be um lured away to work somewhere else right am i going to spend time with a human who's actually saying hey i'm going to spend some of my real human time with you because i think you're interesting or am i going to spend an hour or two doing automated tests for a company that won't even take any of their time to talk to me that may never even be reviewed by a human so um we could go on yeah, and on yeah. about that topic. For sure. And just to put one final, you know, really fine point on it, we both mentioned it, but I think it's really important to note is just, again, reminding us that, yeah, in a few years from now, five years, 10 years from now, who knows, the, the pace of development of and the, the refinement of these tools is mind boggling. And so who knows how long it'll take to get to the point where perhaps this conversation is a little bit obsolete and maybe the tools are just way more refined and, and better than they are now. But right now we're in the wild, wild west of these tools and their capacity. Um, and there are still tons of limitations. <laughs> so we, we it, you know, I'm all for embracing technology and experimenting and, you know, uh, figuring out how, what the use cases and how they can be useful. I'm all for all of that. And I think we totally should be playing in the space, in the sandbox and trying to figure out what, what works. Um, but that's a different thing than just like wholesale adopting a new unproven technology and saying, this is our answer. This is going to fix everything for us because it's just not true. Um, and you're going to end up causing all sorts of, you know, unintended consequences um, that you haven't even conceived of yet that not just you haven't conceived of yet, but that like society at large hasn't conceived of yet. Right. Cause it's all so stinking new. Um, so all of that's really, really important. All right. Um, let's pivot now and just talk for a few more minutes about, you know, again, within this context of AI automation, um, both in terms of the tools recruiters use in recruiting, but also how it can be utilized um, by developers. Like you were mentioning, it's kind of a multi-pronged thing and how we can frame it up. Let's now think about this in terms of distributed models of hiring remote and freelance workers. Um, Because as you aptly mentioned right at on the outset, coding and a lot of tech types of positions actually actually have been very well suited for remote hybrid um, freelance distributed work for a long time and that's only increased over time and of course the pandemic kind of thrust us into this new world of work where more and more companies are embracing remote models um i guess the, the the question i have is for, for anyone listening who's still wrestling with this, or maybe they're thinking, I want to do a back to the office mandate, um, as many CEOs are doing, um, what what are kind of the pros and cons? And what do you see as, as the primary benefits of choosing a distributed model, especially when we're talking about hiring freelance developers? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have a lot to say about the pros and cons of remote. Um, I mean, number one, first and foremost, people, most people like it. <laughs> um, it's it's a big perk. Unless you're a certain type of uh, individual, like you're in your 20s and, and you're, you're looking for that sort of networking in real life and meeting people or 
um, which which is valid, right? There are certain, or or you're just a very like gregarious person that you just mm-hmm. need that human. You know, there there's I'm not saying that it's that it's uh, there aren't certain people that that prefer it. Or you're in a certain industry, like you're a doctor. You know, you you've got a telehealth is real too, but but there's just certain things. You're in manufacturing. I don't know. You, yeah. You've got to do yeah. hands-on stuff. It's not going to work. Um, but for a huge part of the workforce that has a family or has a, and has an hour long commute, Mm -hmm. um, when you think about, um, their ability to have work-life balance, um, their ability to save money on gas, to save time on their commute, to have the company save, um, costs on not having to have an office Mm -hmm. um when you think about the 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 commuting impact on the environment um there are the the pros in my mind on on the whole vastly outweigh the cons and and i think that if you've got a company um that has different roles and different kind of people that you should allow the people that their job role will work okay. Uh, They can do their job well and be productive remotely. And if they want to, you should let them because you're going to be able to potentially even pay people. um, Like if, 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 if I'm a, if I'm an employee and I'm thinking, all right, well, here's a job where I have to commute an hour every day into the city and it pays me 150 K a year. And here's a job where I get to work remotely with my family and it pays me 130 K a year. I might actually take that 130. Um, so you I would might, every day of the week. <laughs> right. So, so like you, you, you might be able to just consider that a perk and you're, yeah. you're saving money yourself. So I'll just say that at first about, I think it's here to stay for the industries that can support it. Yeah. Um, big proponent of it. Okay. Now within tech, um, I think that, you know, you guys have, if you're not in tech, you know, some people haven't heard of like agile methodology or, or in particular there's scrum and Kanban. And I, I, I think that the scrum methodology that has been embraced by software developers kind of by just by following some core parts of that, you kind of mitigate some of the problems with being remote, which are like, you know, Mm -hmm. people not feeling connected, um, people. And so one of the core things of Scrum is that every day you have, if you have a, you have a team and they get together on a daily standup call and you try to do it every day. You don't have to do it every day, but it's on their calendar every day and you get together and everyone on the team sort of says like, Hey, Usually, inevitably, you get on while we're while you're waiting for everybody to join. Everything. Oh, hey, what did you do? What what's going on? And people feel like a little water cooler kind of thing going on, and they talk and they connect. And then everybody says, "Hey, what?" Ever goes around as well. Okay, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm going to be working on today. These are the questions I have, um, and it and it spurs conversation and connection, and that sort of not all software teams follow that, but we try to make mm-hmm. teams follow that. And I think it goes a long way when, when you follow that methodology, you don't just let people go remote and don't kind of add any sort of structure that, that forces them to to come together and collaborate. Yeah. I, I, and I completely agree. I think finding ways to embed touch points with remote or hybrid workers uh, you can build in mechanisms. It doesn't happen as organically as it might in a physical office space, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. You just have to, you know, whether it's a scrum or there's a variety of things you can do to just make sure that you have mechanisms for people to be touching base and interacting with each other and feeling a sense of belonging and community and collaboration and all those things, which are usually the things people are highlighting when they say, oh, you got to get back to the office. Well, Damien, I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you and find out more about your work and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Well, they can connect with me by going to scalablepath.com and either filling out the contact form or 
if you're looking to hire a software developer or designer or any sort of person to help you build a digital product, you can click our hire now button and tell us about what you're looking to do. Um, and the final word, I guess, um, yeah, it's an interesting time uh, with AI and, and remote work, but uh, I would say that what's coming out through all of this is the importance of human connections through, through all of it. I think that's a common common thread through everything we said. And uh, I definitely believe that. And if you stick to that, you'll, you'll be all right. Yeah. Well said, Damien. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Damien and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.